Hello Internet, Seth Skorikowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the Octung Cthulhu Adventure, A Quick Trip to France. Published in 2020 by Modiphius Entertainment, the scenario appears in the totally free Octung Cthulhu Quick Start Rules. Coming in at 16 pages, the scenario is playable in just 3-4 to four hours, walking game masters through the game mechanics and the world of Octung Cthulhu. It also provides us with 5 pre-generated characters to use, as well as a handy quick reference sheet to give to your players, which I greatly appreciate the inclusion of that, though I still do recommend that you give your players the 12 pages of the quick start rules themselves, that way they've got a, a fuller reference that they can look at, but a cheat sheet is super handy for them to reference, as well as you to reference mid-game. Now, I've already covered the rules portion itself in a separate video, so I'm not going to repeat all of that stuff here. Anyone that's wanting my thoughts on the rules or a brief how-to can check that video out. This video is simply over the adventure itself. The scenario is pretty short, it's just four scenes long, and we finished that up in about four hours just as advertised. Unfortunately, it left a little bit to be desired. I punched it up for my players, but it still didn't impress me the way that the other Quick Start Adventures have done, uh, including those other ones from Modiphius Entertainment that we have played with. Conan. So what I'm going to do is offer my thoughts, my criticisms, and suggestions as a game master who has run this adventure. Hey, and I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to parachute into occupied France and give those Nazis a piece of my mind. One bullet at a time. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. Hot, delicious spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your Game Masters this way to see about running the adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, your only choice is to run your Game Master through it yourself, or face a court-martial. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. As I said, the adventure provides us with five pre-generated characters. The characters themselves are fine. Uh, some are two pages long, while others are only a single page long. Unfortunately, I don't like the layout of these sheets. They only show us the skills that the character has, and all of the skills that are in the game, which really does help the players learn the system better if they can see all of the possible skills that the game offers. So what I did is I filled in several regular character sheets for my players to use, highlighting any specialty focuses. Though there were a couple discrepancies, such as Captain Swan has Survival Jungle and Urban listed in the Adventure Sheet, but the full game character sheet doesn't list those focuses, so I suspect that the Quick Start might have had some minor artifacts left over from a previous edit of the rules before the full rulebook came out, so it didn't make any difference as far as this adventure was concerned, because neither Jungle or Urban Survival were used in the adventure at all, but I found these full character sheets much easier to use, so if Game Masters want to use these for their game, I stick a link down below in the video description in order to download them. The scenario is set across four scenes, and it does a very good job at clearly defining each scene. It also provides us with clear scene objectives, which is nice to help game masters along. The adventure opens in June of 1940. The Black Sun, a sinister Nazi occult force, has taken the French village of saint sulac kicking all the regular Nazis out and taking residence inside the chateau. The resistance leader, a man named Aramis, messaged Section M about the events, including the presence of the Black Sun master Hans Stoller. Unfortunately, before he could finish his message, Aramis and the resistance were attacked by the Black Sun. So, Section M has assembled a team to investigate and find out what's going on. And that team is the player characters. The adventure opens as the player characters are flying over occupied France. The adventure gives us a super long opening to read aloud to your players, you know, giving the backstory and the mission objectives and a passphrase to use once they meet Aramis. Now, one thing that I've learned with read aloud sections and adventures is they feel about 10 times longer when you're using them in game. Oh yeah, we stopped listening about 20 seconds in, so anything you say after that, we're probably not going to hear it. Even then, anything you do say that we do hear, we're probably not going to remember that information by the time it's important. So for my game, I gave a brief summary and then made this handout for my players detailing the important information and allowing them to reference this page later on. Once the mission objective is given, the player characters are then to parachute out of a plane, requiring an agility plus athletics test of a difficulty 1. Now one character, Captain James Swan, has the truth of being a veteran commando, something that I talked about in my video that was covering the rules. Now because of that, the module suggests that you lower the difficulty for that character to zero, meaning that any successes that he rolls can then be turned into momentum for the other characters to use. Unfortunately, while that might sound really cool in theory, that is not how that worked out for us. You see, the only character that has the athletic skill at all is Sarah Walker, who has a 3 and also has a 10 agility, giving her a 13. She has the highest chance of success. 
The other characters, Daphne Rogers and Dan Gregg, each have an 8. Sven only has a 7. And even our veteran commando himself, who has a 100% chance of success, he has a 7. Meaning that he isn't likely to be getting all the successes in order to generate momentum to give to the other player characters. So the very first role of this game is for them to use a skill that only one out of the five player characters are even any good at. The result is, is that most of us jumped out of an airplane with less than a 65% chance of success. That's, uh, that's not the best odds. The adventure acts like this is going to be a breeze for them to do, saying, remember you can't build up more than six momentum, as if that is even likely to happen. It talks about complications if any of them roll a 20, but what it doesn't talk about is what happens if the characters fail their rolls. Now the quick start rules themselves state that for some rolls, a game master might elect to do success at a cost of one additional complication, which is great to know, that way you don't open up the game by killing the player characters off or forcing them to dump any fortune points in order to succeed. So using success at a cost only one of our player characters managed to land on the ground having zero complications at all. As far as complications, the module suggests having the characters get blown off course or landing in a tree or some unfortunate circumstances. A warning not to be too punishing to the players this early on in the mission, and game masters might simply cash those complications in for threat to use later on. Personally, I think we can be a little bit harsher with the complications here, especially if the player character has multiple ones. So, for example, uh, maybe a character might lose an item, such as they lose a weapon or one ammo or some piece of equipment that they likely didn't strap down on themselves as well, and once the shoot went taut, that little item went flying away. Now, maybe they're you know going to just be using their sidearm on this adventure, maybe have to borrow a buddy's weapon until they can acquire a new weapon for them to use. Once they're on the ground, they're going to need to make some rolls to figure out what their position is and then head off towards the village of St. Sulac, but then all of a sudden an unnatural chill surges through them, causing one die of mental stress. Now, this isn't going to be enough to actually hurt them. Their stress tracker is going to refresh immediately after this at the end of this scene. It's merely meant as a way to kind of show that supernatural forces are at work here and the player characters need to hurry things up. Okay guys, there is definitely some sort of mythos magic going on around here, so we gotta hurry our asses. Also, I dropped my gun at about 500 feet up, so anybody got another piece I could borrow? Now this opening scene is a little lackluster to me. I mean, we jump out of a plane, but there's no significant consequences if we have any failure. Uh, then we have to find our position, but again, no real consequences for failure outside of it's going to take some additional time, but this is an untimed mission, so who cares? And then we feel the effect of some mythos magic, but any damage that we get is instantly healed because that scene is going to end, so there's not any real risk at all throughout the duration of the first scene of this adventure. So what I did is I added a couple bad guys here. Near where the player characters landed, I had two regular German soldiers that had a motorcycle and they were armed with an MG42, and they were supposed to have been evacuated when the Black Sun took over the chateau, but uh, their bike had some mechanical trouble, so now they're beside the road fixing their bike up. So these soldiers heard the player characters landing, and they stepped into the woods to investigate what that sound was, and that could lead to a possible firefight, or at least requiring the player characters uh, some stealth in order to get past them, kind of ask them if they uh, kind of pull up their silk and stuff that back in their bag and took that with them, and I figured it was a good way to inject a little bit of excitement, maybe a potential combat just early on in this adventure, just right out the gate. Uh, maybe even give the player characters access to this bike and its sidecar if they manage to fix it, or maybe give them access to this full-size machine gun. Or they can interrogate the soldiers who really aren't going to know anything outside of you know how to get back to that town uh, because the Black Sun made them leave the town, but it gave them a little bit more information, and it certainly would make the scene a hell of a lot more interesting than it is now. The next scene is an hour later as they reach St. Sulac. We get a map of this village with obvious things that are marked on it, such as the burnout farm and the chateau, and some not so obvious things such as the house with the cellars and the barn that they don't know about yet, meaning that this map isn't appropriate to give to your players because it's got spoilers on it. So with a little Photoshop I made a blank map that I then gave to my players which we could then fill in all the location tags as we played. Again, game masters who might want to use my map, uh, they can find that as well as my other handouts at the link below. The burned farmhouse is where the resistance was attacked. Now there isn't anything there outside of some dead livestock, but I did the remains of a radio and a radio tower and some ruined supplies that my player characters were able to kind of check out, kind of piece together what all happened. 
Questioning a local farmer can give them some information about what's been going on, as well as give them directions to where Aramis, the resistance leader, is hiding. After speaking with him, another wave of mythos energy hits, and this one doing two dice worth of damage, not enough to injure any of the player characters, but enough to kill one of the farmer's cows. You know guys, this doc magic stuff is only getting worse. I say we just go ahead and charge that Black Sun compound guns blazing. They will never expect that. That would be a terrible idea. The module acknowledges this, saying that Game Masters should imply that this would be very difficult to do due to the number of guards, and possibly remind them that their primary orders are to find Aramis. This was also one of the reasons that I printed out a physical set of orders as a handout, to remind them of what their mission actually is. Getting to Aramis requires sneaking across the village. This requires an agility plus stealth test of difficulty 1. Complications for this are also pretty weak. It's meant to ratchet up the tension and put the players on guard, so so a fail check could mean someone glimpses them from a window and then hides, or a pair of black sun guards approaches, looks around at them, blames those noises on some cows or some chickens. Again, I suggest that we give this a little bit of teeth here. So if the player characters maybe fail a check, have the possibility that a black sun guard might spot them, and now the players, you know, they have to hide or you know quietly take this guard out. Or say that because uh, the player characters you know, might get spotted or they did get spotted, they're going to need to take a longer way around the village, requiring a climb check to get over a fence or something like that, in addition to another stealth check somewhere else, giving failure an actual cost, something more that they have to do. Because at this point, none of the roles that we've had so far have had actually any risk to the player characters themselves. Look, we understand that failing roles sucks. Nobody wants to bomb a freaking mission because one person failed their freaking stealth check. We get that. We understand. We encourage failing forward as a good way for game masters to keep the game interesting and fun. But there does become a point when the players realize that they haven't suffered any consequences at all for all those failed skill rolls that they've been doing. And when that happens, their enjoyment in the game diminishes because they're going to realize that all the risks they overcame and all the challenges they faced were completely meaningless and all of this is just one big freaking railroad. Once they find Aramis, they're going to see that he's been injured. Now, one thing that I added here was an old man with an old World War I style revolver that was helping take care of him. So I didn't have Aramis just kind of sitting down here all by himself. Aramis gives the player characters the story about what happened and how the Black Sun have been rounding up all the villagers and uh, bringing them inside the chateau. He begs the player characters for help, but he advises against doing any sort of frontal assault against the chateau. Instead, he tells them that there's a hidden tunnel leading from a nearby barn that then comes up underneath the chateau. The third scene is at this barn itself. On the way there, another wave of mythos magic hits, this one's significantly stronger than the previous ones. Personally, I think if the player characters had some poor roles, you know, finding the town back at scene one, and they took extra long in order to find this, this third wave should have happened earlier, before the end of scene two, meaning that the combined stress with that and the one that they had earlier might actually cause real injury to them, you know, something that doesn't just replenish at the end of the second scene, and that way it gives us real consequences for failing those roles earlier because now this took them extra time to get there and now that lost time actually means something. Anyway, so for this third scene, they sneak to the barn. There they might notice some Black Sun guards that are entering the building from the other side, one bad guy per player character. Okay guys, we're in the third scene of a four scene adventure and we ain't had a single fight yet. So let's go back into that barn and do what we came here to do. Let's shoot us some Nazis. The fight here is pretty straightforward, though I would have appreciated a map just to show us the zones. The Black Sun, who are inside the building, they start off with two cover. But I also suggest that once the player characters manage to get inside the barn, uh, the Black Sun might take cover behind the milk truck and use that for cover. Now the reason for that being, one, it makes sense that they try to get cover behind the truck or anything else, but two, at the end of the fight, the player characters are going to discover that the truck has been damaged, making it harder for them to move that off of the trap door. There's no role for this. It just happens. So I say you have the truck get shot and damaged as a result of the players rolling a complication, or if they're firing at the Black Sun soldiers who are using this truck for cover. So between this and the possibility of it just being a complication, it's likely that the truck is going to get damaged, but if not, I say that you don't damage the truck at all without having to spend any sort of threat to do it. Again, this is all about risk and consequences, and I don't like the fact that the truck is just automatically damaged even if everything that the player characters did went flawless 
flawless, and they made a great plan, they enacted it, and nothing went wrong. So I say that having the truck be damaged should be yeah, kind of really difficult to avoid, but something that is possible for the player characters to avoid. The final scene begins as the player characters are following the ancient Roman tunnels beneath the village. This is going to require some dice rolls to find their way. I do like that it suggests that there be a cost for failures, adding two points to the ritual stress tracker to represent the time that they've lost. I feel that it's something that should have been suggested as a cost for a previous task earlier on in the adventure that we're going to take any longer than expected, you know, where if they take too long to get to the village, uh, the stress tracker is going to be further along. If they take too long to sneak across the village, the stress tracker is going to be further along, adding an actual time scale to this entire adventure. At the end of the tunnel, the player characters pop up in the chateau cellars, where Hans Stoller and his minion cultists are conducting a ritual to receive Nyarlathotep's blessing. We also have six civilian prisoners that are tied to pillars before the altar. Now, this is the final fight of the adventure, and once again, just to echo my regular complaint that I made about Medivia's 2D20 adventures, is I really wish they'd given us a map for this. We get a description where the four zones are, but honestly, the description wasn't the clearest to me, so I really would have loved a picture of how this place is actually laid out. Now one thing that I added though is that I added two more alcoves, just like the alcove that the player characters popped up in. Uh, one of those alcoves houses more civilian prisoners, you know, future sacrifices that the player characters might get to rescue. And the other alcove holds the torn and shredded bodies of the previous sacrifices, six for each of the three waves of mythos power that the player characters have felt over the course of the adventure. Now Stoller is conducting a ritual, which means that every round the game master rolls a certain number of challenge dice in order to fill up the space stress tracker. His novices can also aid this, and if he completes all three steps of the ceremony, the player characters lose. So the player characters must defeat him or disrupt the ceremony before that can happen. Now it was at this point that the adventure itself, when we played it, that it went really bad for us. First, I had built up a lot of threat over the course of the adventure, so I went ahead and started using it here. So I spent one to make Stoller more difficult to hit with ranged attacks, I also spent two more threat for him to call in three Black Sun Troopers, and then just to make this finale a bit more interesting, I spent another threat to give one of those troopers a flamethrower. In addition to that, because my players and I were all new to the game, uh, they didn't remember and I didn't remember to remind them that their spellcasters could use the counterspell reaction to make this summoning ritual much more difficult. I also should have offered to allow the player characters to make an insight plus academia test to realize that the ritual could be stopped if the book that Stoller is using is either closed or destroyed. Uh, this would be a difficult test, but you know, since I even failed to offer for the test for them to roll, I can't really say if that would have made any difference or not. And the result is that we lost. It was a tough fight. I mean, we went several rounds against those jerks, and we were probably just one round away from kicking that dude's ass. One of the player characters even came up with the idea of, you know what, next round I'm going to destroy that jerk's book. But before she got the chance to do that, Seth made this freakishly killer roll in that ritual casting, and it filled up that tracker the rest of the way, and that was all she wrote. That was a bummer. I can blame a little of this on the rules not being perfectly clear and the lack of map because I'm pretty sure I laid that room out wrong in addition to those two alcoves that I added, but a good chunk of that was really just my fault and also the fault of my dice because my dice just decided that they wanted that game to go poorly at the wrong moment. So while it's pretty well on record that I am not a big fan of this rule system and the shortage of examples that it gives in the full rulebook, I'm not gonna lay the fact that this game didn't end well solely on the rules because I am clearly to blame for a good portion of this. The adventure ends one of two ways. If the player characters succeed in stopping the ritual, they manage to flee the area before enemy reinforcements arrive and they make their way back to London. If they fail and the ritual succeeds, the player characters flee and they make their report, and I feel that a failed result should also come with a will plus resistance test for any of the mental stress that was caused by the summoning's completion, sort of a final surge of mental damage before the survivors are able to make their escape. Overall, I'm pretty underwhelmed with this adventure. Ignoring my complaints about the game's mechanics, my biggest issue was the lack of consequences. Again, this is a four scenes, and we're halfway through the third scene before we even have our first taste of combat. And we don't need to be slugging our way through the entire adventure, but I feel that the possibility of a small skirmish with one or two bad guys, that way we uh, maybe have to avoid those bad guys, or maybe just have to take them out, uh, yeah, maybe that could be a consequence for any failed 
skill tests, you know, that would liven the adventure up. Instead, we have several scenes where they really don't risk any consequences unless the player characters bypass the clearly laid out path that they're supposed to be following and attempt some sort of frontal attack against the chateau or something. Failing to jump out of the plane, no significant consequences. Failing to find their coordinates means a loss of time, but no actual consequences because the adventure isn't timed and the set events with the ceremony are all unaffected. Failing to sneak through town has no actual consequences or risk, making this more a story more of a railroad than an RPG adventure. Even unfortunate events, like the milk truck being damaged in the barn, that was simply something that happens. There is no possibility of this being avoided, meaning that it wasn't a consequence, but a predetermined thing pretending to be a consequence. And that might have been why during that final combat we spent most of our time battling all the low-level goons and not paying too much attention to the big bad until it was too late, because nothing during the adventure really felt like it had much consequence, so you know, we just didn't think it was all that important. Now while this adventure wasn't my jam, some game masters and players out there really might enjoy this. After all, it is totally free and drive through RPG, and a free quick start rules and adventure is still a free quick start rules and adventure. So any game masters out there who are wishing to run this adventure, I stuck a link below to drive through RPG in order to download it, but I also stuck a link below for anyone who's wanting to use my character sheets and the handouts that I made for my group. I hope you enjoy them. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, or how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, after you went through all the cost to getting this heavy-ass steel helmet and this really cool prop stin gun and even World War II dog tags that got my name on them, though I am a little salty about the fact they wouldn't let me put whiskey on there as my blood type, we have got to come up with some sort of excuse to use all this crap again.